Good day, Justin Miller, Oxford College Physics here. We are going to start looking at some rotation. So uh, up until now, we've just been treating everything kind of like as point masses in a sense, where nothing had a tendency of flipping over, rotating, anything like that. So we've stuck with linear motion, now we want to start doing a rotational motion. So, like I said, for the most part, we've been treating masses as, hey, you push on it and it moves in that direction. But what happens if I push on it in different locations? Like what happens if I push on it up here? Oh shoot, it doesn't slide across this plank here, it just flips over and undergoes some sort of rotation. So there's something about where we apply forces to objects that's important, extended objects. We can also take some object like this and notice, well, what does it probably want to do if I push on it? Oh my gosh, look at that, it's rolling. It's rolling, spinning around and moving forward too. So we want to be looking at that as well. I can just take some object, like a wheel. Wheels like to roll, right? There we go, spin it around, we're good to go. We're just spinning around and around and around, and can go slower, slow down, slow down, slow down, and stop eventually, but undergo changes in this rotational behavior. So what we want to do at this point is just introduce a rotation and start to discuss rotational quantities and look at some particulars regarding our rotation. So, let's just start with this. Rotational quantities. Rotational quantities. So, we need to be able to quantify rotation to discuss it coherently so that we're all on the same page regarding discussing it. So let us think about some things, right? I'm going to take this meter stick and I'm going to rotate it about this far end here and I want to talk about what sort of behavior I can um, extract from it, right? So I take it like this and I rotate it like that. I ask you, how much did I rotate it by? And you probably say 90 degrees. Or maybe you say pi over 2 radians or you say quarter of a circle. There's different ways of representing how much that rotated, but it rotates by some, well, by some angle or some segment of a circle, some sector of a circle. So what we want to be able to do is just be able to quantify that, discuss it, and that we'll call it angular displacement. ultimately change in angular position. We're going to use delta theta. It's angular displacement. And has SI units of Radians is going to be the SI unit of angular displacement. You might say, well, why not degrees or some sectors of circles and stuff? We'll get to that at a later point in time. SI unit is going to be radians. There's a good reason for that. I'll explain a little bit later. But we're going to use delta theta. So really, delta theta itself is just some theta final minus some theta initial. It is a vector quantity. But we're going to treat rotations for now just in a plane. So it's either going clockwise or it's going counterclockwise. So it's kind of one dimensionalizing something that's inherently at least two dimensional. We'll get to that a little bit later. It's just a change in angular position. There we go. So what I can note in terms of this delta theta for a rigid object, an object that's nice and stiff, the whole thing rotates through the same angle together. This whole stick, every point on it, moved through pi over 2 radians. That's great. That's great because we don't need to talk about different locations on it. We just talk about the whole object undergoing a rotation of some delta theta. Now, in that we're going to be dealing with rigid objects here. We also have that this angular displacement occurred over some time interval, right? It went from this angular position to this angular position over some amount of time. Or I could start spinning it around like this and say there's some angular rate 
at, what this, at which this object is a rotating. So what we want to define then is angular velocity. The rate at which angular position changes with respect to time. definition of it, we can look at average angular velocity. This is not W, this is an omega, lowercase omega. And I'll say omega sub average. Well, that is going to be equal to the angular displacement divided by the time interval over which that angular displacement occurred. Much like we had just velocity being the linear displacement of which time interval which it occurred, we define angular velocity in the same sort of way. So, we've got this, and then we've got, for instantaneous angular velocity, we have that omega is defined as d theta dt, time derivative of angular position. So, <clears throat> there we go. We have some quantities here regarding angular velocity. And then we've got SI units. Well, we already said that the SI unit of angular displacement or angular position for that matter is gonna be radians. And we know the SI unit for time is seconds. So the SI units of omega is going to be radians per second. There we go. So we can talk about some number of radians per second, and that's the angular rate. And again, the nice thing about that is that if it is a rigid object, everything moves through the same angle in the same amount of time, thus every position or every point on a rigid object undergoes or has the same angular velocity at any given moment in time. That's a nice as well. What do you think's next? Correct. We've got ourselves some angular acceleration. Angular acceleration is ultimately the rate at which angular velocity varies with respect to time. And we can look at average angular velocity or instantaneous, excuse me, average angular acceleration or instantaneous angular acceleration. Average angular acceleration. We use alpha. And alpha sub average is going to be equal to delta omega over delta t, which is ultimately some omega final minus some omega initial divided by t final minus t initial. Change in angular velocity over the time interval which that change occurred defines our average angular acceleration. We've also got instantaneous angular acceleration. just use plain old alpha 4 and as you probably figured that is going to be the time derivative of angular velocity itself. SI units of alpha. Well that has to be radians per second per second which is then going to be radians per second squared. 
So what sort of change in angular velocity is there? How many radians per second do you increase or decrease the angular velocity per second? That is angular acceleration. So we've got these nice definitions and they're very similar to what we had with respect to linear motion as well. So that's kind of nice. This is what we want to start utilizing, discussing, um, and ultimately looking at systems undergoing or having rotational aspects to them, being able to understand a rotation. All right, so let's just go ahead and look at a special case where we've got, say, a constant angular acceleration. We will consider constant angular acceleration, which ultimately means that the rate at which the angular velocity is changing is a constant. If it increases or decreases its angular velocity at a constant rate. So consider constant angular acceleration. Alpha is equal to a constant in other words. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, gosh. So we've got some things going for us. We've got some definitions. We've got that omega is defined as d theta by dt. And alpha is defined as d omega by dt, which can then also be written as d squared theta dt squared. So we're going to stick with these nice definitions here and think about what we can do. Well, we've done it before with linear motion. Let us focus our attention on this relation right here. We'll go ahead and put it over there. And what I'm going to do with this is I'll multiply both sides by dt. So we can write this as d omega is equal to alpha dt. A little differential form there. What does that provoke you to do? Hopefully you say, oh, that makes me want to integrate. So that's exactly what we'll do. We'll go ahead and integrate both sides, due to one side or due to the other. And the nice thing about this, if alpha is a constant, it just comes out of the integral, right? It has no time dependence. So we're left with the integral of d omega is equal to alpha times the integral of a dt. Well, that's going to be a pretty easy integral to solve because the integral of d omega is just omega and the integral of dt is just t. Of course, there's some limits of integration, or if we don't care to put them in, there's some constants of integration, which we could group up and analyze. We've done this before. Let's just go ahead and group up the constants of integration from both sides, throw them on one side, call it c, c1, and go from there. So the integral of this becomes omega. This side becomes alpha times t plus some constant of integration c1. And obviously the question becomes, well, what is c1? We go ahead and evaluate this at t equals 0. Omega evaluated at t equals 0 should be equal to what? That's right. This is angular velocity as a function of time. So evaluated at t equals 0 should give us our initial angular velocity, which is this is zero, that's equal to C1. So ultimately, we have that omega final is equal to alpha T plus omega initial. Does that look familiar? I hope so, because that's exactly the same form of the expression for velocity regarding constant linear acceleration. V final is equal to AT plus V initial. We're looking at angular acceleration with constant alpha. So that's great. We get an expression. If we know what the constant angular acceleration is and we know what the initial angular velocity is, we've got ourselves that we know what the final angular velocity is at any given moment in time. Great. Well, that's one thing to know. What's some other things? So happens if we go ahead and come on over to this other nice definition and say, well, what can we do with this? Well, again, we can multiply both sides by dt and write this as 
d theta is equal to omega <coughs> dt, <coughs> excuse me, and that makes us want to integrate, of course, as before. The thing with this is that omega is not a constant. Omega is going to be changing with respect to time because there's an angular acceleration. So we can't just pull this omega out, but we already know what it is. We know it's time variance. It's right here. This is omega as a function of time. So we can go ahead and rewrite this as the integral of d theta is equal to the integral of the quantity of omega, excuse me, alpha t plus omega initial dt. And yeah, we're going to have some either limits of integration, that's fine, or some constant of integration that we can figure out, much like we did over there. Let's just say there's constants of integration, we'll group, throw it on one side, call it C2, and figure out what it is afterwards. Integral of this, that's just going to give us theta. Integral of this is what we really want to get. So what we have here is something that we can split up a little bit. Let's just go ahead and do that. We've got the integral of d theta is equal to, I'm going to take this first section here and say, we got the integral of alpha t dt plus the integral of omega initial dt. All right, so we've got that going for us. And then we've got some really nice things regarding that. So what do we have that's nice? Well, we have that alpha is a constant and omega initial is a constant as well. Those are two constants of the system. So those two vectors there can be pulled out in front of the integral and we've got this. So omega initial equals constant. It's just an initial state. Alpha is equal to a constant. So we've got that the integral of d theta is equal to alpha times the integral of t dt plus omega initial multiplied by the integral of just terminal at dt. So again, yeah, constant integration, we're just going to group them all together. And what does this become? Well, this gives us theta. This is going to give us, well, we've got an alpha, and then we've got the integral of t dt. Integral of t dt, that's right, t squared over 2. So we've got that this is equal to alpha t squared over 2. And then we've got the integral of omega i dt. That's just going to be omega i times t. So we've got plus omega i times a t. And then we'll just throw in our constant of integration, c2, and deal with that here momentarily. So here is angular position theta as a function of time based upon a constant angular acceleration and an initial angular velocity. And something else right here. Well, let's figure out what that something else is. Theta evaluated at t equals zero has to be equal to the initial angular position of the system, right? That's where we initially are, angularly. So we put in a zero here, a zero there, we're left with c2. So that's what C2 represents. So ultimately, we've got this. Theta final is equal to 1 half alpha t squared plus omega i times t plus theta initial. There is final angular position as a function of time. That's great. It's great. But we can go a little step further with this and just say, well, if it's kind of arbitrary, generally, our initial angular position, what we're usually interested in is what is the overall angular displacement that occurs? <coughs> Excuse me. So we can subtract theta sub i from both sides, and then we've got theta final minus theta initial, which is delta theta. So we can write delta theta is equal to one half alpha t squared plus omega i times a t. Angular displacement as a function of time. There we go. That is exactly the same form as a linear displacement as a function of time based upon constant linear acceleration. Same exact form. That's the good news. 
So we've got some nice expressions right now based upon constant angular acceleration that mirror the expressions that we've already used before. What does that tell us that we can do? Well, if you recall going back and doing a little substitution elimination, developing some other expressions that were useful for a linear acceleration, we can do the same thing. So I'm not going to go through all the algebra because it's distractive at this point. We can also write that omega final squared is equal to omega initial squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. And then what do we have? We have angular velocity as a function of angular displacement. Fantastic. So usually those three um, expressions there suffice for solving any of these problems that we're going to be looking at. That's what we want to be able to do, is utilize these expressions, solve some stuff out, and move forward from there. So let us go ahead and look at a couple problems, shall we? I think that sounds good. All right, let's do that. Be right back. All right, so before we actually look at a problem involving constant angular acceleration, what I want to do is talk a little bit more about some particulars that are of general interest here. So you've got to be careful of these quantities, delta, theta, omega, and alpha, because they are vector quantities. They have a direction associated with them. We are not going to explicitly utilize their directions because well, at this point it's a little bit confusing and we don't need extra confusion. We'll get to that later when we can flesh it out a little bit more. For now there's two ways that something rotates as long as we rotate into a plane it's perpendicular to the rotation and it either rotates that way which well I say is clockwise you probably say is counterclockwise or it rotates this way which I say is counterclockwise and you say is clockwise. So that's kind of a matter of perspective, what side of the object you're on, but we can both agree that it's rotating, right? It's rotating at some angular rate, and if I slow it down, it's slowing down its rotational rate, whether I'm on one side or the other. So we can talk about clockwise and counterclockwise, but even that's sort of subjective. So what we will tend to do utilizing rotation is just say that the direction of the rotation is the positive direction, and that's going to help us out a whole bunch because then we're only left with one thing that can be negative, and that is the angular acceleration. So this is what we have. We will treat the angular displacements and as well the angular velocities as being positive quantities. So for a rotating object, treat angular displacement and angular velocity as positive quantities. So the direction of rotation and the direction of the angular velocity, we'll say, is in the same direction. This then leaves us with the angular acceleration. which is now easy to work out because we already know that if the acceleration is in the same direction as the angular velocity, the object is speeding up in the direction that it's moving. And if, the aim, excuse me, and if the acceleration is in the opposite direction of the velocity, then the object is slowing down. Well, that is for rotational just as well as for linear. The direction of the acceleration with respect to the direction of the velocity tells us whether the object is speeding up or slowing down in the direction that it's moving. So if we always say the angular velocity is positive, then the angular acceleration is negative, the object is slowing its rate of rotation, and if the angular acceleration is positive, the object is increasing the rate of its angular rotation. Now, 
if your acceleration is plus the object is increasing. rotational rate if the angular acceleration is minus negative the object Speeding up rotational wise, and if alpha is equal to a negative, slowing down regarding its rotational state. So that's going to be really easy. We one dimensionalize something and just have a well founded sign convention for the angular acceleration. That would be very useful. So one other thing in terms of our rotational quantities. We said that the SI unit for angular displacement is radians, which gives us radians per second for the angular velocity and radians per second squared for the angular acceleration. Radians aren't the most intuitive way of thinking about a displacement angularly or a rotational rate or changes in rotational rates. But it is what we will use explicitly or for the most part, I shouldn't say explicitly, but we will use overall, we want to use SI units. But we can get good ideas of what that, what that quantity really represents physically if we start talking about other ways of describing it, other well, unitizations. The easiest one, in my opinion, is not degrees, but revolutions. So we can start talking about hey, how many revolutions does the object rotate through? Oh, two? That's great. Oh, 12 pi radians as a number? Well, that's a little bit different. Um, but they're the same quantity. Overall, we will find from time to time that we are given angular displacements or even angular velocities in terms of revolutions or revolutions per second or revolutions per minute for that matter. We always want to go back to radians, but the revolution aspect gives us a fairly straightforward way of physically making a connection with, with the system. So we're going to have to bounce back and forth sometimes between radians and sometimes degrees, but radians and revolutions, revolutions and radians quite a bit. And we just need to really have down the conversion factor between them so that we can bounce back and forth between the quantities. So ultimately, we know that one revolution, if you go around once in a circle, how many radians do you have? That's right, you've got yourself two pi radians. One revolution is equal to two pi radians. And in degrees, that's 360 degrees. So if you can remember that, we can convert in between any three of those quantities. And again, usually we're going to be wanting to go back and forth between revolutions and radians. So if we have something that's going 6.28 radians per second, what does that mean? Well, 6.28 radians is ultimately 2 pi radians, approximately, which is one revolution. So something that is rotated at a rate of 6.28 radians per second is going around one revolution per second. That's really nice to be able to think about because the 6.28, unless I make the connection, doesn't really ring a good bell with me. Um, saying, oh, one revolution per second, that gives me a good ability to understand, hey, every one second goes around one, two, three, four, and so on. So, utilizing this, again, if we want to go back and forth between radians and revolutions, I could get this to say that one radian 
is equal to 1 over 2 pi revolutions. That's fine. <coughs> Which is equal to 180 over pi. Degrees. And uh, that's good. Or we can write it out in terms of degrees. We can have that 1 degree divide everything by 360, right? 1 degree is equal to 1 over 360 revolutions, 160 of a revolution to the radian screws, that's okay, which is equal to pi over 180. So there's the conversion factors between any three of those quantities. This is going to come in handy, again, especially this one to this one. And that's that. So let's just go ahead and do a problem now, shall we? Involving some constant angular acceleration that has some notions of radians and revolutions and speeding up and slowing down and all that good stuff. So one moment here. All right, here's the problem. So we've got ourselves an object that is initially at rest and undergoes, or begins to undergo rotation, and after seven seconds, it's rotating at a rate of 32 radians per second. <coughs> We want to know, hey, what's the angular acceleration of the object then? And what's this angular displacement in well, radians, degrees, and revolutions? And we'll go on and ask some other questions about this. So we've got some object initially at rest. So we have omega initial is equal to zero. We can list a little table of some of these quantities. This is obviously a good idea. We've got some omega final, its final angular velocity. We are told is 32 radians per second. And that change occurs over a time interval of seven seconds. And what do we have with respect to the rest of the quantities? We've got some alpha and we've got some delta theta. So just like we had with the linear stuff, we've got this with the angular. Five quantities, you know three of them, you can find the other two. And this is what we want. We want to know, A, what is this angular acceleration? Hey, alpha is equal to what? So, what do we do? We look to our expressions for constant angular acceleration, which we'll just go ahead and write over here again. We've got the delta theta is equal to one half alpha t squared plus omega i times t. That omega final is equal to alpha t plus omega initial. And omega final squared is equal to omega initial squared plus two alpha delta theta. Two fundamental time dependent expressions for constant angular acceleration, and another one that comes in very handy. So we know the angular velocity, initial and final, and we know the time. And it looks like this one's going to solve it pretty easy for us. So we just want to rearrange that and write it in terms of alpha equals. So we note that omega final is equal to alpha t plus omega initial, which we can then solve out for alpha being equal to omega final minus omega initial divided by t. And then we can just go ahead and calculate this out, right? We got the final is 32 radians per second, initial is zero, and that change occurred over seven seconds. So we've got ourselves a nice 32 divided by seven, gives us 4.571, 4.571 units. Radians per second squared. Here we go. There's the angular acceleration. This object must be changing its angular velocity by 4.571 radians per second every second that goes by in order to have an angular rate of 32 radians per second over a time of 7 seconds when it started from rest. Ooh, a little bit of mouthful. That's okay. So what else do we want? We want to know what is the angular displacement? We want it in three different unitizations. We want it in radians, we want it in degrees, and we want it in revolutions. So, 
part B. Delta theta equals what? So we just go ahead and start finding that. We know what the angular acceleration is now. 4.571 radians per second squared. If we want, we could go ahead and use that. We don't have to, but we could. Um, yeah, we'll just go ahead and use that because everything else up there depends on alpha. We don't need other expressions. We've got what alpha is. So we can just go jump up onto, let's say, the top one. That one's pretty easy because it's all written in the standard form. We've got ourselves delta theta is equal to one half alpha t squared plus omega i times t. And we note that omega initial was equal to zero, it was initially at rest. So that becomes irrelevant, and we get ourselves that delta theta then is equal to one half times alpha. Well, alpha is 4.571 radians per second squared times the time squared. Well, the time was seven seconds. Quantity squared gives us five times that times 49. Gives us 112. 112 radians. There's the angular displacement of this object. Well, without thinking about it much, 112 radians isn't really something that just goes, oh, that's how many times or how much it moved. I don't know. I kind of have a disconnection with that. Obviously, you can make conversions in your head and get a good idea, but do the conversion, right? 112 radians itself, to me, doesn't really strike a big bell or anything. But there's the angular displacement in radians. Let's convert this into degrees. Well, if we come up here and look, we've got that one radian is 180 degrees over pi. We've got 112 radians. So 112 radians is going to be equal to 112 multiplied by 180 degrees divided by pi. Because one's just this, 112 would be 112 times that. So, we get ourselves 6,417 from some decimal places. Not so high of degrees, right? Whew. Lots of degrees. Well, again, that many degrees, that just tells me, hey, a lot of degrees. Let's, let's go ahead and represent this in terms of revolution so I can get a good idea. How many times did this object actually spin around in that seven seconds? <coughs> Excuse me. Oh my gosh. So we've got ourselves a couple different things that we could do. We can convert degrees into revolutions or we can go back to radians and convert those to revolutions. It doesn't really matter which one. I'm going to go ahead and convert this because that's going to be more typical, bouncing back and forth between radians and revolutions. So again, we've got that one radian is equal to one over two pi revolutions. We've got 112 radians. So 112 radians is equal to 112 divided by two pi, and that is revolutions. So we take the 112. Run it by our 2 pi, and we got ourselves 17.825, 17.825 revolutions. That's easy for me to think about. Hey, over 7 seconds, this object spun around 17.825 times. Great. Good deal. All right, so we've got ourselves a way to quantify some things. That's a good. Now let's move forward with this problem and change the circumstance slightly and say now that this object is rotating at 32 radians per second, it begins to slow down and it comes to a stop over five full revolutions. How long does it take it to stop? All right, let's check this out. So now we've got some different things. Those don't really apply anymore. Now we've got this initial angular velocity is 32 radians per second. We've got its final angular velocity must be equal to zero because it comes to a stop. And we've got the delta theta, as we're told, is equal to 
five revolutions. And we want to know how long does it take it to actually come to a stop. Well, we're still just going to be utilizing these three expressions right here. So we could write down another one. I just wanted to play with those ones. So we'll play with those. <coughs> so if I want to get time, but I don't know what the angular acceleration is, utilizing those three expressions, I can't do it. I need to be able to figure out what the angular acceleration is. So let's just go ahead and find that, shall we? Let's get the angular acceleration first so that we can figure out what the time is. There's no harm in that. Maybe good to know what is the angular acceleration. So we're going to first get alpha. So how do you want to get alpha without knowing time? <coughs> the third expression down there gives us the ability to well, make a correlation between alpha delta theta and the omega. So we've got ourselves. Omega final squared is equal to omega initial squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. So a couple of things that we've got to be a little bit careful of here is, well, namely, delta theta. This is in revolutions. This is in radians per second. We can't be mixing stuff up here. We want to use radians. Just use radians. So we've got five revolutions. How many radians does that equal? One revolution is two pi radians, so five revolutions is going to be equal to ten pi radians. So there we go. We've converted this ten pi radians, and now we're good to go here. So we'll go ahead and solve this out for alpha. We'll subtract omega initial squared from both sides, divide by two delta theta get that alpha is equal to omega final squared minus omega initial squared divided by 2 delta theta, which gives us 0 minus the quantity of 32 radians per second quantity squared divided by the quantity of 2 times 10 pi radians. So we've got 32 squared divided by quantity of Well, I get negative 16.297. Negative 16.297 radians per second squared. Why do we get negative here? Should we be having negative? It's yeah, slowing down, right? We're treating all the other quantities as positive. The acceleration is negative. The object is slowing down. We're told that it's slowing down, so we better be getting negative. And Check. Make sure things make sense, right? There it is. So there's the angular acceleration. Now that we know the angular acceleration, negative 16.297 or radians per second squared. So we can go ahead and figure out the time interval over which this object actually comes to a stop. So the middle expression up there, omega final is equal to alpha t plus omega initial, would probably be the easiest way to go about that. So let's just do that. We've got ourselves, now get time. Omega final is equal to alpha t plus omega initial, which we can write as <clears throat> t is equal to omega final minus omega initial divided by alpha, which is equal to zero minus 32 radians per second divided by negative 16.297 radians per second squared. Yes, indeed. That is good. The negative signs cancel out as they better because we're only interested in positive times here. But 32 divided by that gives us 1.963 seconds. And there we go. We're for this object to come to a stop over five full revolutions when it's initially going 32 radians per second. It must take 1.963 seconds and undergo an angular acceleration of negative 16.297 radians per second squared. All right. So that's it for the basics of constant angular acceleration, how to utilize it. What we want to do is start expanding on it. There's more things that can happen, and that's what we'll be doing shortly. All right. Have a good one.